Well, guys, as always, I'd like to thank you all for joining. My name is Jonathan. I come from a background in software engineering. I spent the last six years at Google leading the AI and ML in the region. And recently, half a year ago, I co-founded Shujin AI, which is an AI consulting company, and we've been taking on various projects. Also, we run this community. We very much think of it as a community. And if you're watching it live, thank you for joining. If you're on the YouTube, there'll be a link below in the description. Join us. We have sessions every two weeks, which are also uploaded to YouTube afterwards. If anybody wants to deliver a session or be part of a panel, feel free to message me. What we'll be covering today Today, as you saw on the meetup, we'll be covering hallucinations. Very briefly, I'll be giving an intro. Then we'll be discussing why models hallucinate. And last but not least, we'll be discussing how to deal. We'll be focusing most of our time on how to deal with hallucinations. I've tried to aggregate a list of relevant ways. Aside from listing the ways, I also have prepared somewhere around the range of seven to eight demos, which I'll show in the end. As always, we'll be sharing the CoLab notebooks. Anybody watching on the YouTube, they'll be in the description. So what is a hallucination? Very uh, succinctly put, a hallucination is when a model outputs an incorrect answer. It can be very simple as the example that you're seeing here on the left. How many M's are in the word weather? And the model outputs that there are two M's in the model weather. Pretty easy to, to see that the answer is incorrect. The model is hallucinating. Uh, there are more complex ways or more complex scenarios. I think when we work with companies, we're making use of the entire context window, which if we're talking about Claude can be 200,000 tokens. Uh, and it's maybe not as easy to figure out when or how the model has hallucinated. When we're talking about incorrect answers, it needs to be incorrect in relation to something. More specifically, we're talking about knowledge. And knowledge can be incorporated into models in two very general ways. The first one called parametric and the other one non-parametric. Parametric basically means that we've pre-trained the model and now the parameters which represent the model have the knowledge in it. Um, and the second one, non-parametric, means that we're giving the model context via the query. So if you ever hear those parametric and non-parametrics, don't fret. Basically, they mean whether it's already inside the LLM or whether you're supplying it on the fly within the context. Types of hallucinations. There are various types of hallucinations. Broadly speaking, we can categorize them into four. Sentence contradiction. I've also listed here an example. So a, a sentence contradiction, let's see. Write a description of a landscape in four word sentences. So the model answer is the grass was green, the mountains were blue, the river was purple, and the grass was brown. So as you can see in the output, there's actually a contradiction into the sentence itself where it initially says that the grass was green and later says that the grass was brown. A prompt contradiction. This is where it does not follow the instructions in the prompt. So here I say, write a birthday card for my niece and it outputs happy anniversary, mom and dad, which is not precisely what I asked for. Factual contradiction. Factual is obviously when it doesn't get the facts right. My prompt is name three cities in the United States, and it outputs New York, Los Angeles, and Toronto, which obviously not all of those are cities. The last one is not really a contradiction per se, but it still falls under hallucinations. It's when the model simply outputs something which is either irrelevant or just flat out random. Describe London to me. So it says London is a city in England. Cats need to be fed at least once a day. Technically, cats probably do need to be fed once a day, but it really has nothing to do with what I asked. 
as always, you don't have to start from scratch. Uh, if anybody has seen our session on LLM leaderboards or how to benchmark, uh, which also I'll put a link above in the YouTube, feel free to go watch it. Regarding hallucinations, there are several leaderboards, um, one by uh, Hugging Face, another one by Victera, which I really liked and is linked here. And you can see that they measure the different hallucination rates uh, of the model and the factual consistency. You can see that those are kind of complete each other. If you hallucinate at 3%, your factual consistency uh, is at 97%. Uh, on the right, you can see various ways that they have actually used in order to benchmark it. What they'll do is they'll generate a lot of different samples in regard to a fact generated by the model, and then they'll kind of measure how often the sentence is supported by the samples. So you can think that if all of the samples generated have nothing to do with the actual fact here that he was born in Milan, Italy, then there's really no factual consistency and the model just hallucinates whatever answer he wants. But on the other hand, if 97 out of 100 times the samples will have some kind of supporting information for that given fact, then it's pretty consistent and it kind of stands to reason that the consistency here mandates that it's being factual because how otherwise would it know to it always output in the same kind of relevant information. Why are hallucinations a problem? They're a problem for various reasons, and i just sharing one kind of use case that had already been publicized out on the web. First of all, um, models are used everywhere, and they're used to create content, um, short or big, whether it's a small LinkedIn post or whether it's a a blog post or even a book, and, and you can be spreading misinformation. The second one is user harm. On the bottom here, you can see three examples of mushroom cookbooks and mushroom harvesting books, which were publicized on the web. And allegedly, they were written using AI. And the reason that could be harmful is, as you all know, mushrooms can be very healthy for you, but they can also be very deadly. So just writing a book with AI, and if the AI gets gets it wrong and tells you that a toxic mushroom is actually good to eat, it could be very dangerous to you. Uh, obviously, there are much um, you know, less, less life-threatening examples, which could still be harmful for the user. The last one is user trust. We're kind of going through this process, society of learning to adopt this new technology. And the more consistent, the less it hallucinates, the better we'll, we'll be relying on it, the more comfortable we'll feel. And there have been some publicized use case, you know, where a model kind of really goes off rail. And from that point on, enterprise are not willing to use it or are less willing to use it. Uh, so the less they hallucinate, the more trust they have, the more willing people or organizations will be when it comes to using them. <clears throat> uh, broadly speaking, can categorize why hallucinations happen into two, two and a half places. Uh, first of all, it's the data and the model. And here reasons can be we simply have insufficient or outdated or low quality training data. And an example for that, a really easy example for outdated would be BARD or GPT or any of the big models. They're only trained up to a certain point in time. And from that point on, the model is kind of lacking until the next update. We all saw this when we were using either BARD or ChatGPT in the last year. I think they updated, they, they updated them a couple of times. And if you would ask it beyond a certain point, it would answer, I'm sorry, I simply do not have the information. Or sometimes it would hallucinate. Let's say you'd ask who the president of the United States is. And if it was only trained up until 2021, it would output uh, whoever was the president of that time um, and so on. The second uh, is that the model might just simply have missing data, encoding, decoding mistakes, 
bias in the data itself. We all are aware of the example which we gave uh, it back in the prompt engineering session, which again is also in the link below on YouTube. Unfortunately, the models have bias incorporated them because they have learned from information open on the internet. And that information also has bias in it. So if you ask a model, what is Dan most likely to do as a profession in a hospital? He'll say doctor. And if you ask the same question, but juxtapose it with Anna, then she's most likely to be a nurse. And these biases propagate into the model itself. Another one is ambiguity, optimization challenges, and simply overfitting. Uh, the simplest example I can give for overfitting, I could train a vision model to think that every picture it sees is a cat. Uh, and then obviously that would be wrong. And you could say that when the model sees a picture of a dog and it says that it's a cat, it's actually hallucinating an answer. The second area where models might hallucinate are in the prompting when we're actually querying the model. And that can be a consequence of many, many different things. Simply bad prompting. We have a session on that. We reviewed that. You have to know how to prompt in order to extract maximum value. <clears throat> Context understanding limitations. Most of the prompts you probably write as an end user are relatively small. When you're working at scale within a company on a use case, you'll be working with nearly the entire context most of the time, which for Claude can be 200,000 tokens. It, the models still have limitations and we still don't know exactly how they understand the context. And there are things such as recency bias and positioning bias and so on. The second is, the third, sorry, is error propagation. The model is probabilistic by nature, and you all probably know that it chooses a next token. Yes, we're able to converse with it, and it has fluency, and it has ability to reason, but that's just kind of emergent capabilities. It, once the model kind of selects a direction, and you can see this when you work with ChatGPT, that it's continually streaming the answer. It, sometimes, if early on, or at some point, it will choose the right, sorry, the wrong token, it kind of snowballs into that. It, it goes down a path on the decision tree of options. And if it took a wrong turn early on, it kind of snowballs into it. And the last one is adversarial attacks. Uh, this used to get more PR early on in 2023. Now, not so much. When an example to that would be, you know, getting the model to talk positively about genocide. I find that less interesting. Obviously, some people might say, hey, but you know, there are scenarios of attacks where they get the model to regurgitate information. Let's say you have a model that serves a lot of different customers and you somehow create a prompt that makes the model tell you information about the data it was trained on and it might have been trained on other customers' data. That isn't so much an hallucination as what I have dubbed regurgitation, and that is a different problem. So here I'm only talking about adversarial attacks, which make the model talk about information that it has not learned, not information that it has learned on, but you might not want it to talk about. How to avoid? We have reached the bulk of the session. I will go through, I think it's almost 10 different ways of how you could avoid hallucinations. Uh, some of these are more costly and obviously all of them have varying value. I by no means recommend that you take this grocery release and now go implement this one by one. I think a very good analogy to how you should think about avoiding hallucinations is security. When you're designing a system or when I was designing a system back on my time at Google, we always took security to mind, but security is kind of this never ending road. You can always have a more secure system. You can always put another entry to barrier for some kind of attack. 
I think the same kind of applies to hallucinations. You really need to think what's your margin of error and what gives you the most cost value trade-off and implement those. Starting from the data. And data is maybe the most obvious one and probably the hardest one to enhance. If the data is bad, the, mo the model is bad. And if the model... In our analogy, you know, if the data is bad or incomplete or dirty or has bias in it or simply has wrong information, you're going to get that wrong information when you query the model that's been trained on this data. And a way to handle that would be to enhance the data quality, which could mean a lot of things, anything from adding more data, doing some things to augment the data and maybe stress points that the model wasn't able to learn as well. Again, if I'm going back to the example of, uh, of, you know, cats and dogs and stuff like that, if I have only one example of, let's say, an anteater, I could augment the data to have more data points of an anteater. And that way, the model might not confuse an anteater for a very small two-tailed pig. Synthetic data, again, a way to make more data where... I didn't have any data before. We discussed this in the past. A very good uh, method to use with LLMs, especially if I'm training a smaller model or training an open source LLM, I can create synthetic data using one of the stronger models such as Gemini or GPT-4. And the last one is cleaning your data. If your data is dirty, if your data has misinformation in it, you're gonna carry that on. And obviously one way to avoid that would be to spend time cleaning your data. The next one is the model. If the model is bad, if the model hallucinates, going back to the tab table that we saw with the leaderboard, there are some simply some models which are better. Okay, GPT-4 only has 3% hallucination. And some of the older models such as Palm or Palm 2 have, uh, I think it's 10 or 12% hallucination. You can know that in advance. You don't have to wait until you see it in production. And if it bothers you, you can simply switch the model. Obviously, there are costs incurred. You have to actually switch the code in the model. And there are also costs incurred because there's a correlation. The stronger models cost more and they also hallucinate less. If you're building the model scratch, you can improve the model architecture. You can have it you know, have more contextual or temporal awareness. You can fine tune the model. Here, I'll say there's a lot of things you can do. You really need to understand what you're doing when you're fine tuning the model. And you could do, use some techniques such as regularization techniques, adversarial training, which is again, uh, training it not to be prone to all of those adversarial attacks and ethical and bias training. Um, there are a lot of ways to do it. There's obviously getting another data set. There's using RLHF. There's using RLAIF, which is similar to RLHF, but actually using uh, the models for the judgment um, instead of humans. Parameters. Uh, if you've worked a bit with the models in the context of using an API, you have for, sh for sure seen these things, things such as temperature, top P, frequency, penalty, and presence penalty. <clears throat> I wouldn't say these necessarily mitigate hallucinations, but they they do, on the, on the flip side, kind of affect it. So just to, to go through them, temperature is how creative the model uh, should be, <clears throat> how random it is uh, in choosing the next token. This is correlated with creativity, and creativity is also correlated with hallucinations. The rest of the three, the top P and the frequency penalty and presence penalty, also kind of affects how they choose the tokens, uh, whether you wanted to, to, to put more emphasis on certain tokens or whether you wanted to put less emphasis on tokens that it's seen in the past. Um, when you play with these, you'll see different results. And if you kind of uh, let them spiral out of control where you want a uh, high randomness and never to repeat the same token, you'll probably see more hallucinations in your outputs. Memory. <clears throat> this is very intuitive, 
um, similar to when you're having a conversation. Here, I just listed a conversation that I had with ChatGPT. Initially, I told ChatGPT that I was in the Bahamas. Then I asked it for a recipe on how to prepare something. And later down the line, I asked it suddenly, what's the weather where I am? And it remembers. Okay? If it wouldn't have remembered, I would have categorized it as an hallucination. Just think if you were at a dinner party talking to somebody and yeah, you told them some information about yourself. And then later down the line, let's say early on, you told them that your name was Jonathan. And later down the line, you see him at the same party and suddenly refers to you as Dan. You're not going to call him out for hallucinating, but he's definitely not on track with the information that you gave him. The same applies here. Uh, by now, if you're look using frameworks such as uh, Langchain or Llama Index, incorporating memory into a memory component into your chats is pretty easy. If you're building a system from scratch, the same should apply as long as you in some ways um, incorporate all context from previous messages by, let's say, summarizing all of the previous messages and appending them in the context together with the query, you should be well on your way to, to avoiding this. Next, we'll be talking about everybody's favorite new architecture, which is RAG. RAG is, um, I mean, basically a best method in order for incorporating external knowledge. It, so incorporating external knowledge, why do we do this? Fundamental models or the really big LLMs are great. They have some emergent capabilities such as fluency and reasoning, but by now people have started using them for their own use case internally within the company, which is also what I hope you're doing, or at least why, why you're here, because you're trying to do this inside of your company. Uh, the LLMs won't always have all of the information. Why? Because they may have not been trained on it. You may be using a smaller model, or you may be trying to incorporate some internal data, which is not publicly available. Um, in that case, you'll be doing one of two in order to incorporate knowledge, either doing RAG or fine tuning. I don't want to confuse anybody, but these two methods correlate to the beginning of the slide when we spoke about parametric or not parametric. Uh, parametric being the model having the information and non-parametric being supplying it in the context. So RAG is when you supply it in the context and fine tuning is when you train it to be uh, incorporated into the parameters of the model. A RAG can be really robust. You can see here just a full blown architecture that we sometimes use with customers. You have the query and then you have an agent and then you have a retrieval and you have a post retrieval and stuff like that. And there are strategies for every single step here, depending on your use case, depending on your constraints, such as uh, monetary constraints, like how much money you're simply willing to spend, latency constraints, how many uh, calls and which models you're willing to use and so on and, and so forth. Fine tuning is when I take a lot of very good examples. Yes, there's a minimum and some of the platforms indicate that 20 plus examples are enough in order to fine tune a model. And if you're only trying to give it like a new style of writing, then maybe 20 or 100 examples might be enough. As is always, the more the merrier. Uh, don't fret uh, overfitting because the models are pretty big, but also think that if you're bringing a data set, you always want it very well distributed. And as I said before, when I generally spoke about anti-hallucinations methods that we're reviewing here, for anybody seeing this, eh, I also don't recommend doing all of this from the get-go. You can do some pretty simple rags, which offer a lot of value without thinking too much. Eh, we'll see some demos eh, specifically of rag and ragas when we get to eh, later stages of the deck. Um, and maybe it will be a bit clear of how this works and why it's so great. Great. Uh, next is post-processing. 
Post-processing can mean a lot of things and there are a lot of techniques uh, such as output classifiers and guardrails and log probs, which we'll see uh, in the demos in a while. Technically speaking, you can do this after every stage, but there are two most common places in an architecture to use post-processing. One is straight after the retrieval. And the next one is after the generation, okay? So post the retrieval, I might want to correct the information or put it in the right format. And post the generation, I might, might, might want to verify that it's right and maybe, you know, make the request again if I verify it and see that it's not to my liking. There are a lot of really uh, cool techniques here such as log probes, guardrails, output parsers, which we'll see in the demo in a while. For more sensitive use cases, you could probably, you should probably use some kind of human in the loop or other things. Monitoring. Monitoring is not specifically gonna help you avoid hallucinations on the fly. Yeah, on the fly is probably going to be somewhere in the output parsing and stuff like that. But monitoring is very important for your overall health of your system. Yeah, there are a lot of things that you can do here. Yeah, my favorite one is using RAGAS, which is a framework for evaluating RAG systems. And we'll see a demo of RAGAS in the end. Specifically, when we're talking about hallucinations, there's the answer faithfulness metric which basically measures how factually accurate the model was or how good it is at not hallucinating. Prompt engineering. I've kind of alluded to that throughout the talk up until now. Uh, prompt engineering is very, very important. It's the place to start. You have to know how to prompt engineering and you can avoid a lot of mistakes and hallucinations by prompt engineering in a good way. This is by no means an exhaustive list. As you all know, we had a talk, which is on our YouTube for an hour, just about prompt engineering, but things which can help you avoid hallucinations are things such as specificity, clarifying ambiguity, obviously providing examples. We review chain of thought and few thought and simple stuff that's such as saying, Telling the model that if you don't know the answer, simply say, I do not know the answer. I've given an example here to the right. Uh, and here you can see, I asked a question and basically I'm asking uh, if my hands are cold and I want to warm them up, what is the best sort surface uh, to do that? I took that question from the ARC dataset, which is kind of a science Q&A dataset benchmark. When I don't specify the answers, the model goes kind of on a tangent and gets to a not so much relevant answer and not really answering what surface I should use. When I specify that it can either use dry hands, wet hands, or human hands, it goes on a, a saga of explaining why, but at the end also says that if I'm you know wanting to warm up my hands, I should probably use dry hands to do it the quickest. Pipelining. Pipelining basically means breaking up your process into uh, different steps. Different steps allow you to uh, make use of a lot of different methods, which might offer all kinds of benefits aside from, from making the model more robust and less likely to hallucinate. They'll, they will offer, a lot of the times we do this in order to reduce costs, to reduce latency, uh, but they also offer a very good way to uh, avoid hallucinations. Uh, if you're looking at the example here on the right, so I have a query, which I could simply send to an LLM directly, or I could run it through a pipeline. In a pipeline, let's say, would initially try to extract some keywords using a regex, it would check those keywords uh, with a predefined taxonomy, which I prepared in advance. It would use that in order to formulate a query using a prompt template to an LLM. I could then 
parse it to make sure that I get it in the right format, let's say a JSON format, and then work with that in order to create an SQL query to an internal database. I could let the output be used in order to formulate a very long or chatty answer before I summarize it. The reason I want to let it do a long answer and then summarize it is where I spoke earlier about like error propagation. If the model kind of takes a wrong turn, it might kind of steer into that full force. Uh, when I try to make the model answer very short, like only use two words, only say yes or no, a lot of the times it gets the answer wrong because you're not allowing it to think. Okay? Uh, the model has the ability to reason. Okay, That's one of the great things that we got with the, with the new LLMs. But you need to let it think. The same way you, you as a human need to think in order to formulate the right answer, the models also need to do that. And they can't simply do it out of thin air. They need to go down the road of generating tokens. Uh, there is a, the downside of that is, first of all, you'll be paying for that thinking or for all of those tokens. Uh, it might take, it, it takes more time. But normally this leads to a better answer. And to complete the pipeline, I could just, you know, summarize that answer and I could verify it in several ways. Here I just chose to check the log probs. We'll see a demo for that in the end. Checking the long probs simply uh, peers into the um, uh, how uh, confident the model is for the tokens that it generated. And it allows you to see, okay, if it says that the answer is A and the confidence for that is 90%, then it's most definitely probably A. But if it says the answer is still A, but it only has like a 60% confidence, maybe maybe I want to do something. Maybe I want to try a different method. Maybe I want to uh, use stuff such as self-consistency, uh, which we've spoken about in the past, uh, querying the model several times and uh, polling how many times I got the answer or various other things. Next up, we have semantic routing. A very, very cool way we use this a lot. It helps immensely. And let's go through it and I think you'll very quickly realize what, why. I also have a demo for this in the collab that we'll be showcasing and sharing at the end of the talk. Let's say I have a query and for simplicity's sake, it's either pertaining to physics or math, but I could have given this example with politics, history, and more nuanced things, let's say, within the customer context of, you know, um, one product or a different product. Okay, if I have two very similar products and I'm trying to help people get answers for one and not the other, I can uh, do this semantic routing. I have a query, I embed the query, I use a semantic router in order to understand if I should be aiming more at the physics part of the, let's say, the, let's say I have a, a vector database with different embeddings in it. it. Obviously, I want to route it to the physics or the math, depending on the type of question. So I get the answer right. It, we'll see a demo to that in a couple of minutes and it will be very clear. Next is agents. Agents aren't necessarily... <clears throat> I don't think most people will kind of think of them as the first way to avoid hallucinations. Uh, but since agents have the ability to kind of go through this very basic loop of uh, trying to perform a task, getting an answer from an LLM, maybe using a tool, maybe also doing an action on an environment and kind of looking at the answer that they got, which is this loop of reasoning and rinse and repeat until they reach their stop condition. It does actually help increase the performance, which is why a lot of people use agents. And they are a good, if if maybe kind of a more expensive way to avoid hallucinations. I say expensive because it's not the first place to start. We discussed in the past, the first place to start is necessarily prompt engineering. Agents are kind of the cutting edge. And um, another thing I want to note, aside from the ability of them being able to kind of check what they did, 
they're also able to use, use tools. If you ask a model, what is 32 to the power of three and no model, I don't think even GPT-4 gets that right right now. Out, out of the box, it's not able to um, uh, get that answer right, unless it uses the code interpreter, in which case it can. But if you use one which doesn't have a code interpreter, but it's still considered an LLM, it will guess, it will guess wrong because it's guessing. When you use agents, agents can use tools and tools can be very specific and specifically here with the, let's say 32 to the power of three, it will understand that it needs a calculator tool and it will use it. Let's say it has a, a calculator API, you'll get the right answer. Wow, we've gone through a very comprehensive list of ways to avoid hallucinations. We are nearing the end. Uh, the collabs in the description. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for joining today. Uh, as always, we've enjoyed this. If you have any questions to me, feel free to reach out on LinkedIn, follow me on Twitter, and definitely, if you can, subscribe to our YouTube channel. We try to upload most of the lectures and relevant content such as RAG and RAGAS on a weekly basis. And I thank you all for joining. Have a great weekend, guys.